God is doing something new based on something old. He is doing something new among his people based on an old and unchanging reality. God is equipping the followers of Jesus to have a new appreciation for the reality of the Holy Spirit in our lives. God is doing it here in our church. And he's doing it in his church around the world. Let me connect the dots for you so you can see what our God is up to. A few years ago, one of our very faithful seniors, Irma Thompson, Irma said, why doesn't our church celebrate the day of Pentecost? Now that's a great question. After all, Pentecost is a historic day. It's described in dramatic fashion in the New Testament. It's the day when God sends his spirit to invade the world in a new way. It's the day when God sends his spirit to invade and empower believers in a new way. Why shouldn't we celebrate this moment when Jesus equips his followers to carry on in his absence by giving us the power of the Holy Spirit? So Irma, thank you for asking that question. It got me to ponder, and to pray, and to think. And then a couple of years ago, I brought this up in a staff meeting, and we discussed it together as a staff, and we agreed that we should celebrate the day of Pentecost every year. And that decision was affirmed by our elders. And as you know, I tend to plan sermons way in advance, so as I was laying out the preaching schedule, I planned a two-week series on the Holy Spirit and Pentecost for last year. Because we believe that God wanted us to dig more deeply into the importance of the Holy Spirit. And we did just that. Little did we know, though, that God was prompting us to do this as part of a bigger picture. Shortly after we decided to emphasize the day of Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit, we were given a special monetary gift from someone outside the church so that our ministers and our spouses could go away to a ministry conference together. We decided to attend the Bible conference at Pepperdine University. And as we enrolled in that conference, we discovered that the topic of the conference was, guess what, the Holy Spirit. And so when we attended that conference together last May, we heard from speakers around the world. And they described how the Holy Spirit is stirring up God's people in all kinds of new ways. Now about that same time, I was given a magazine, art, magazine article written by another senior in our church, Larry Bailey. Larry had written an article for publication basically addressing that same question. Why doesn't the church celebrate the day of Pentecost? We need to. And Larry, I'm so grateful for your faithfulness in writing that article. I'm grateful that you passed it on to me. It was added confirmation that we were being led by the Spirit in what we were striving to do. Then two weeks ago, my wife and I head over to Boise Bible College for the spring conference. And the theme for the week was, guess what? The Holy Spirit. Once again, we heard more about this new, fresh movement of God's Spirit at work among God's people. Do you see a trend here? <laughs> I think it's clear that God is prompting his children to take more seriously the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And unfortunately, we sometimes neglected the Spirit. And we've sometimes done that out of fear, I think. Because the Spirit can prompt us to do things that are unpredictable and perhaps even make us uncomfortable. Yet we need to recognize that the Spirit will never prompt us to do anything that goes against the plain teaching of Scripture. And so we don't need to fear the Spirit. We need to learn how to listen to the Spirit so we can be led by the Spirit. And as we listen to the Spirit, 
He will show us how to live out the biblical truth that we do know. He'll show us how to be more faithful followers of Jesus. Now, if you've been paying attention, we've been working on this over the last couple of years. The language of the Spirit is permeating more of our teaching and more of our conversations. And we're trying to learn how to listen better so we can hear when the Spirit speaks to us. We're trying to learn how to respond when the Spirit prompts us to act. And for many of us, this is new. And yet, the Holy Spirit isn't new. The Holy Spirit's part of God. He's been with God since the beginning, from before creation. And the gift of the Holy Spirit is part of the unchanging message of Jesus and the kingdom of God. And that's why Jesus told his disciples that the Spirit was coming to invade their lives. The Spirit would come to transform them so they could transform their world. And that's why the day of Pentecost is so vitally important. And that's what Jesus talks about in his final words to his disciples, which are recorded for us in the book of Acts chapter 1. This morning we're going to turn there and look at verses 1 through 14. Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water. But in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now Luke, the author of this account, is a fascinating guy. He was a physician, he was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul, and he wrote two books of our Bible, the book of Acts and the book of Luke. And he originally wrote them so that a friend of his named Theophilus could learn about Jesus and get connected to God. I've always been struck by that. I find myself wondering, what what kind of effort are you and I willing to make to help a friend find Jesus. Luke wrote two whole books because <laughs> he was concerned about Theophilus. Well, here at the beginning of Acts, Luke highlights the fact that Jesus conquered death. He rose from the grave and he appeared to his followers for 40 days. He didn't just appear though, he continued to teach. And the message of the resurrected Jesus was the same message that he proclaimed during his life. It was about the coming of the kingdom of God. During his ministry, everything Jesus said and everything he did was focused on building the kingdom of God. He began his ministry with these words. The time has come and the kingdom of God is at hand. At hand. Repent and believe in this good news. It was an invitation to step into a transformed life and become part of a continually transformed community. And through his life and through his teaching, Jesus began to usher in this new kingdom. And yet now, as we read this passage, Jesus is preparing to return to heaven and the work of the kingdom is incomplete. The Holy Spirit is coming to equip his followers to carry on in his absence. However, even as Jesus tells them about this, the time for the Spirit has not yet arrived. So Jesus says, you need to wait. You need to wait just a little longer. We're not told how the disciples would have responded to that comment, but I think it's possible they might have felt just a twinge of impatience. I I certainly would have. They've already been waiting for 40 days. 
Jesus now says, wait some more. And to me, this is, this is a classic example of how God often deals with us. We are so impatient. And we're impatient, I believe, often because of pride and selfishness. And we want God to work on our timetable. And we hate it when he makes us wait. And yet waiting can be incredibly important because it shifts the focus from us to God. Waiting promotes the godly humility that we all so desperately need. Furthermore, waiting, waiting can, can build a sense of anticipation and expectation and can highlight the importance of what it is that we're waiting for. And the coming of the Holy Spirit definitely is worth waiting for. The coming of the Spirit is not something to take lightly. Jesus says that when the Spirit comes, he's going to baptize people. The followers of Jesus will be baptized with the Spirit, which means that people of faith will be immersed in and enveloped by and filled to overflowing with the Spirit of God. The coming of the Spirit means that for the first time in human history, every child of God will be personally connected with God through the personal presence of the Holy Spirit. And it should be mind-boggling to recognize that part of God actually lives within every believer. And in response to that... It's good to spend some time waiting and contemplating what does that actually mean for me as a follower of Jesus. So Jesus tells them to wait. To wait for this coming of the Spirit who will baptize them. And yet there's, there's an even deeper reason to, to, to wait. It's, it's a reason that's going to rock the foundations of their world. Because next, Jesus is going to tell them that the Holy Spirit will come with power. The Holy Spirit will give them power. And this is power that should humble them because it's not power to hoard for themselves. It's power to faithfully represent Jesus in this world. The Spirit will empower them to help people far from God get connected to Jesus. And this will rock the disciples because, because at least at this moment it's not exactly what they're looking for. They have a different agenda. Look what happens next. Then they, that's the disciples, gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now this question that the disciples ask highlights a core human problem. When it comes to God's plans for this world, his priorities are pretty clear. Yet at times, we try to substitute our priorities for his. And that's precisely what happens here. Remember, Jesus has spent three years talking about the kingdom of God. He explained the values of the kingdom of God in his Sermon on the Mount and he continuously told parables to describe what life is like in the kingdom of God. God's kingdom gets priority because it is both a present reality and a future hope. God's kingdom encompasses heaven and earth and it impacts us both now and for eternity. And the kingdom of God is what transforms people and cultures and communities. And the kingdom of God is the only hope for broken people in this broken world. And it's so sad that the disciples don't yet see this. 
They can't see it because they're steeped in a worldview which places their nation at the center of God's purposes. To them, nothing is more important than for Israel to regain its independence from Rome. To them, getting Israel free from Roman rule is far more important than the fact that the world is full of people who are spiritually adrift and who need to be invited into the kingdom of God. Their question about restoring Israel is a symptom of an age-old struggle. Our tendency to sometimes place nation ahead of God's kingdom. And this question is a symptom of another age-old human struggle as well. Our tendency toward nostalgia. As we get older, it's ever easy to think that the best days are behind us. And to think that somehow the future ought to look like our idealized memories of the past. And these men want Israel to again be what it was like in the remembered glory days of long ago. Yet God does not want his people to be anchored in the past. He wants us to learn from the past. And then to trust him with a sense of expectation for a future that most likely will not look like the past. And God asks each of us to live by faith trusting and believing that the best days always are ahead as we follow Jesus. And the disciples don't grasp it yet because their priority is Israel, not the kingdom. So Jesus pointedly tells them that their question is wrong. The Spirit is not coming so they can restore Israel. The Spirit is coming to give them power to help build the kingdom of God locally, regionally, and globally. In other words, there is nowhere in this world that will be out of bounds for their influence when they are led by and fueled by the power of the Holy Spirit. That is a radical message for anyone, but particularly for a group of Jews. Because Jews, like many people, but in particular Jews, loved to draw boundaries around their relationships. There were, peop there were people and places they deliberately avoided. We're not going to associate with you. We're not going to go into that neighborhood. We're not going to hang out with people like that. Yet Jesus says that when the Spirit arrives, believers will be equipped to share the message of Jesus with anyone and everyone in every conceivable place. Jesus is telling his followers that the Spirit is going to empower them for a very different, a dramatically different kind of future. one with huge implications for this world. And when we let the reality of what Jesus is saying soak into us, it's very clear that this invasion of the Holy Spirit is going to be very disruptive. His arrival is not calm and orderly. It's disruptive, and we'll see that next week. But it's disruptive in a way that is so beneficial for building the kingdom of God. Think about this. Since our human tendency is to draw boundaries that limit our relationships, and we do that because we prefer to hang out with certain kinds of people, usually people that are most like us. But if those are natural barriers that we tend to form then we need the Spirit's power because the Spirit can give us the power to punch through those boundaries and equip us to fulfill what Jesus is saying here. And I find the implications mind-boggling. I really do. 
the Spirit can empower you and empower me to become concerned for and to care for and to even love people that we might otherwise dislike. The Spirit can empower us to overcome our prejudices. Whether those prejudices are racial or ethnic or socioeconomic or whatever. When we rely upon the Spirit's power, we can actually build friendships with people whose morals are different than ours, whose politics are different than ours, whose lifestyles are different than ours. And in all of our relationships, the Spirit can empower us to act and to speak in ways that are gracious and loving. So we can help people who are far from God learn about Jesus and be drawn into God's kingdom. Because that's what's most important. That's why the Spirit will come. And as we think about what the Spirit can empower us to do. This description of his power in action may sound rather idealistic until we realize that it actually has already happened (laughs) more than one time. We see this exact kind of transformation take place throughout the book of Acts after the Spirit's invasion. We see that people are changed, communities are changed, and the kingdom of God grows by leaps and bounds. And that same thing happens time and time again throughout human history. Wherever and whenever people embrace the reality of the power of the Holy Spirit living within them. The same thing can happen to us It can happen in us. It can happen through us as we increasingly learn to rely on the Spirit's transforming power. His power to equip us to live by faith and to represent Jesus wisely and well in this world and draw people into the kingdom of God. It is an amazing message, an amazing invitation that Jesus is giving them here. And yet at this moment that we're reading about, this moment when Jesus tells his followers that they will be empowered to push past all of their traditional relational boundaries, they're not actually very excited. (laughs) He's telling them something that is way outside their worldview. He's telling them something that's way outside their prior experiences. What he's telling them is revolutionary and countercultural for a group of people steeped in Judaism. And it's no surprise then that as they think about what Jesus has said, they're not initially ecstatic about the future. I think they recognize that this invasion of the Holy Spirit is going to disrupt the way they think and disrupt the way they live. So when Jesus tells them this, you're going to get power, and you're going to be my witnesses anywhere and everywhere. They don't hoot and holler and jump and shout. They are shocked into immobility. And they stand there and they stare into space as Jesus leaves them behind. Verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. And those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas son of James. Listen to this. They all joined together 
constantly in prayer. Join together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now, for 40 days, the disciples have seen Jesus appear and disappear and appear and disappear. So they may not realize that this really is the final goodbye. God sends two men dressed in white, we're told, to clear things up. And that description usually indicates that these are angelic beings, messengers of God with a very specific message. Hey guys, Jesus just went away to heaven this time. He really is gone. He'll come back eventually, but in the meantime, in the meantime, they've been left with this overriding purpose that Jesus described. Their purpose is to be faithful witnesses for Jesus, regardless of where they go or what they do. And in the years ahead, it might be that they wind up with regular jobs. They might marry and have families. They might travel or have to relocate for business reasons. At some point, they'll retire from work, perhaps. And yet, throughout the rest of their lives, they will be empowered by the Holy Spirit to draw people to Jesus and into the kingdom of God. And that can happen. That does happen as they listen to the Spirit and as they allow themselves to be led by the Spirit. And now because Jesus told them to wait, the disciples have some additional time to prepare for the arrival of the Holy Spirit. And I think we need to see that this extra time of waiting is a gift. It's a gift because they need some time to process what Jesus just told them. They need to be able to process what lies ahead and prepare themselves for what lies ahead. And I love how they prepare. They prepare as a community of faith by praying together. They prepare themselves by praying Because they know that prayer touches more than our minds. It touches our hearts and our souls and connects us more intimately with God. And they pray together because they know that praying in community breaks down the walls of our prideful independence and our isolation from others. Praying in community is encouraging and empowering and deepens our connection with God. So the believers pray together as they wait And as they prepare themselves for the coming invasion of the Holy Spirit. An invasion that will change them. And will empower them to change the world. And help build the kingdom of God. Now as we look toward our own celebration of the day of Pentecost next Sunday. I think this week. It's a great time for us to pray and perhaps even to fast. To take some time to prepare ourselves for what this day means in our lives. Now it just so happens that this coming Friday is the first Friday of June, which means it's our monthly day for prayer and fasting as a church. So I'd like to encourage everyone to fast in some way this coming Friday. To take some extra time to pray. And as we fast and pray, let's ask God to help us experience more of the power of the Holy Spirit. And we can do that together throughout the day, even though we're apart. But then we get to come together on Friday night at 7 o'clock. On that first Friday of every month, we're here at 7 for about 45 minutes of prayer. This is our chance to follow the example of the early church that we've seen here in this Bible passage, to come and pray as a community. To pray with each other. And to pray for our world. To pray and prepare for a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. To pray and prepare for God to help us learn more and more how to be led by the Spirit. I hope 
that you will take some time on Friday to fast and to pray. And I hope that you'll join us Friday evening and experience the richness of praying in community as we focus our prayers on the ministry of the Holy Spirit in us and through us. Here's one final thought. As we've been talking about the power of the Holy Spirit, perhaps you feel like that power is not very much present in your own life. Maybe you feel like your faith is kind of stuck in neutral and that you're, you're just sort of going through the motions and you feel powerless. And if that's the case, then I want to urge you to pray and ask God to refresh you with his spirit. And here's what I think gets in our way. We quench the spirit because we're regularly fighting God for control. And I think we just need to pray and say, God, help me to open up my hands and to relinquish control to you so that I can be led by the spirit. If you're feeling powerless, pray that the power of the spirit would become a reality in your life. And if that is what you need, I want to encourage you not just to pray about it, but to ask for prayer. Can you be humble enough to ask someone to pray with you? Can you be humble enough to head over to the prayer corner after the service and ask some church leaders to pray with you? And to do that not worrying about what anyone else will think as you go and ask for prayer. Every Sunday we have leaders there in the prayer corner. And I know today they would be delighted to pray with you and to ask God to help you experience more of the Spirit's power in your life. The Spirit comes into your life and he comes into my life so he can transform us and to give us the power to transform this badly broken world. And the question always is this. Are we listening and are we willing to follow wherever the Spirit might lead?